This week on Vice, the global threat caused by the skyrocketing demand for meat. Our focus is on making the meat as cheap as possible. That's where we often have environmental catastrophes. crisis that humanity is facing in our global water supply. Something's happening. This drought is worse than anything you've ever seen. In the history of farming here in the San Joaquin Valley, yes. Those red spots represent groundwater depletion. It's happening all over the world. The World Health Organization recently classified processed meats in the same cancer-causing Group 1 carcinogens as tobacco, diesel exhaust, and asbestos. But some scientists fear that our global addiction to meat might pose an even greater threat. So this is the very first step of getting the stem cells out of a piece of muscle. If we just take a very small piece of it, in a couple of days, those stem cells will crawl out. Once we have sufficient number of cells, we will provide the conditions for them to uh, grow into a tissue. So what is it that you're actually doing here in this lab? We are creating hamburgers from stem cells. Dr. Mark Post is famous for his work in creating the first synthetic burger. And how long does that whole process take to turn these tiny little stem cells into meat? About seven weeks. So that's much faster than a cow. Much, much faster than a cow. So this is the new uh, McDonald's? Yes. Can I try it? No. <laughs> Mark's first burger cost him more than $325,000 to make. This will be the first time a burger made with cultured beef has been cooked. It's close to meat. There's quite some intense taste but Mark's hopeful he can produce them cheaper and on a larger scale. What are your biggest reasons for wanting to make this sort of synthetic meat in the first place? The demand for meat is going to increase, and there is no way with the current livestock production method that we can match that demand. So that will put a lot of pressure on food security. If we would all say, let's refrain from eating meat five days a week, it would work out fine. But we're not doing that. We're actually doing the polar opposite. Global meat production has quadrupled since the 1960s, and by 2050, it'll increase by half again. One country that's capitalized on that explosive growth is Brazil, which is now behind only the US for title of largest beef producer in the world. There's a hell of a lot of resources that go into a feedlot like this. I mean, water, energy, absolutely everything is done for maximum efficiency, and that means that each one of these cattle gets to eat about 48 pounds every single day. Pedro Marola, owner of the feedlot, explained to us how it works. E esse confinamento consegue, esse curral aqui consegue receber 1500 animais por dia e processar 1500 animais para abate por dia. Então, eu consigo passar 3000 animais por dia no, no curral. Oh, wow. Look at these skinny little runs. Yeah, yeah. These guys are the cattle that have just arrived. É, eles acabaram de chegar, são animais jovens, vão ficar aqui 100 dias mais ou menos. These are the ones that are about to go for slaughter. É, e aqueles são animais estão prontos para o abate, Wow, look at the, the right difference ones. in size that yeah. 3 months can make. Yeah, yeah. You fed these it goes pretty damn well. Yeah. <laughs> Feeding all these cattle is already a massive operation. And Pedro's planning on doubling his production just to keep up with global demand. So what is this that they're mixing up here? This is uh, corn silage. And how much feed do the cows eat every day? 450 tons per day. 450 tons a day? Yeah. yeah. Wow. This system is called a Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation, or CAFO. This CAFO is designed to make these cattle gain nearly 400 pounds in just 90 days. These cattle have been cooped up in their pens, but now they've finally reached the end of the road. They're just being herded towards the final weighing station before heading out to one of several slaughterhouses across the country. How many 
cattle have you got in today? We got in average 1,300 animals a day for killing. They arrived yesterday, so they stay here for 24 hours. By midday, we start receiving the animals for the for tomorrow for the slaughter, and we keep on that pace every day. Um, everything's done on such a mass scale. The amount of cattle that they're processing is crazy. It's one every 30 seconds. Business is expected to get even better. Brazil's about to be allowed to export fresh beef directly to the US. Do you think that your business here will grow because the US is going to be importing more and more beef? It's going to be a major client, yes. Americans ate more than 100 pounds of red meat per person in 2014. And now Africa and Asia are moving toward that same diet. We spoke to Ken Cook, a food policy expert, about the state of meat production today. 70% of the land devoted to agriculture on the planet is devoted to meat production. That's almost a third of the entire surface area. That many acres producing red meat, pork, chicken, all of that is completely unsustainable. Let's assume that the world population will grow to 9 billion people by 2050. There isn't enough land, there isn't enough water, there isn't the capacity for the Earth's atmosphere to absorb all of the CO2 and the methane that would come out of animal agriculture. The problem is that our focus is on making the meat as cheap as possible. And as they cut those corners, that's where we often have environmental catastrophes. <laughs> To see how meat production can lead to those environmental catastrophes, we went to Duplin County in North Carolina, where the pork industry is so big the hogs outnumber people. So this is the lagoon right here. See the pipes coming out? It doesn't smell pretty either. Larry Baldwin monitors CAFOs in North Carolina for the Waterkeeper Alliance. This is the situation. The pigs are in there. They're defecating. You know, so you've got urine and feces dropping through the floor. But then there are slots in that concrete. The waste falls through that and then gets flushed into the lagoon, which is what you see over here. So that's where we can see the pipes coming straight out of this. Each one of these buildings has a pipe that empties into the lagoon. It's a hell of a lot of waste. Right here. People would be outraged, even suggesting that that's the way we would handle human waste. What's the difference? And when you see this region from the air, the scope of these hog CAFOs and their waste is incredible. From up here, you can see every single CAFO is attached to these huge lagoons. Some of them look kind of like pepto bismol color. That's all hog feces and urine. So you do not want to fall into that mess. Look around the aircraft. Start counting them. One, two, Whoa, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and that's just within maybe a five mile radius. There's hundreds of them. There's such an intense concentration here. It's crazy. So to the right of us, there's actually a creek that runs through this wood line. Look how close they are to the water. Not all of that waste is going to get absorbed into the soil. The ground simply cannot absorb this much waste. And according to Kemp Burdett of Cape Fear River Watch, that's wreaking havoc on local waterways. This stream is surrounded by hog farms. You see nitrogen and phosphorus levels off the charts, bacteria levels off the charts. It's raw feces. And how many sort of streams like this are you looking at in North Carolina? Thousands. 
If you're a fisherman or if you're a swimmer, if you're throwing the ball for your dog, you've got to deal with dangerous levels of bacteria. And this creek flows downstream into the Northeast Cape Fear River, which is a part of the Cape Fear River Basin, the largest river basin in North Carolina. It's a problem. You have to pay more to treat your water, which means you have to pay more to drink your water. You drink this water? A fifth of North Carolinians drink water out of the Cape Fear River Basin. And it isn't just the quality of the water that's the problem. In meat-producing regions in the West, it's the quantity. In the dry High Plains region, many feed crops draw water from the Ogallala Aquifer, which is now losing water faster than it can be replenished. Mike Calicrate, a small cattle rancher in this area, broke down the relationship between water, corn, and industrial meat. It takes about 2,500 gallons of water to produce a bushel of corn. And if an animal eats 50 bushels of corn in its time in the feedlot, we're looking at about 125,000 gallons of water per animal under the industrial model. So when it comes to those industrial scale feedlots, the majority of the water that they're using actually goes into producing the corn. That's correct. And the reason that JBS has a big feedlot at Yuma, Colorado is because there's water. And they don't pay one dime for that water. And they pay below the cost of production of that corn. The corn is the cheapest thing that we can feed because we buy it below cost of production. The water is subsidizing that operation. So with free water and cheap corn, the price of mass-produced beef is kept artificially low. The question is, how much of the Ogallala Aquifer do we need to support an industrial model or any model as far as that goes? And if we are so foolish as to let that precious resource run out, that's a tragedy. Mike showed us the scale of land and water used by the giant meat producers here. Yes, basically all the circles that you're seeing here are corn. That's a lot of corn fields. Everywhere you see a circle is pumping water. I think we have to have a true cost accounting going into these production models. The reason that these big companies can do what they do is because they've got the power to externalize so many of their costs, whether it's water, whether it's the pollution of the soil with the overuse of chemicals and the production of the crops, environmental damage, that's how we're able to get a dollar burger at McDonald's. And we're not thinking about the future, we're only thinking about the short term. While this is the system that produces most of our meat, we spoke to one farmer who's going in a drastically different direction. A system that depletes your resource base will eventually crash and burn. Joel Salatan is part of the farm to table movement that focuses on responsible production. He uses a system called rotational grazing. So you just move these cows from this patch into here? Yes, so every day the cows get a brand new salad bar. That was one day's plate full of food. Today they get a new plate full of food. So there's a huge difference between where they were just now and where they are now. Sure, this looked just like this yesterday at this time. And in 50 days, this will look like this again. So this is the way that cows have traditionally grazed on grass, right? This is the role of herbivores in nature. On this type of farm, every animal has a role, and even their waste plays a part. Joel's demonstrating for us this integrated system that he's got going on. So he's actually moving his eggmobile, containing all the chickens, right to the spot where the cows have just been. Hey, here we go. We follow the cows with the eggmobiles, the chickens then scratch through these cow patties, incorporate them into the soil, eat out the fly larva, and actually sanitize the fields before the cows come back through. So it's a very multi-speciated system. I've never seen anyone so excited to eat shit before. Industrial scale farming segregated the animal from its feed. We grow the corn over here. The corn then is fed to cows that are locked up in a feedlot that are generating so much manure, it's toxic to its ecosystem. So the whole system that's supposed to be integrated becomes a segregated series of liabilities. If you farm the way Joel Salatin and producers like Salatin farms, that has tremendous benefits for the land and for the environment. The downside in our current economy is it takes more time, more labor, more management. It's more expensive to do it that way. 
So instead of moving towards the more sustainable model that's been catching on in parts of America, it's mass production that's on the rise in most places. And the market for cheap industrial meat is blowing up around the world. If the meat industry continues as it is at the moment, where does that take us in 20 years' time? Meat production globally is an environmental disaster now. If we try and expand meat production to reach 9 billion people by 2050, it will be a complete, unthinkable disaster. <laughs>